One of the legacies I know I will leave behind in six years of being in office is a strong foundation to support, protect, and improve the conditions of our affordable housing in our city. Maria Regan Gonzalez, the Midwest's first Latina mayor, talks about her city, Richfield, Minnesota's oldest suburb. Retired Mad Magazine writer Dick DiBartolo tells of the time when he and legendary Mad publisher Bill Gaines and Annie Gaines snuck inside the arm of Lady Liberty. And, and Bill said, look, you and Annie go to the torch, because if I get stuck here and we have to call for help, we're all going to be arrested. This is Democratic Visions. Here's producer Jeff Strait. Last Saturday, I, I visited Richfield's Farmer's Market in Veterans Park. We want to do everything we can to, to grow something a little more helpful. Okay, tell me it reconnected me to a town I really like. Richfield, Minnesota's oldest suburb, continues to adjust and thrive with the times. Since the post-World War II housing boom in the late 1940s and 50s, the seven-square-mile city remains solidly middle class. Gentrification, McMansions, and private golf clubs are not part of the Richfield brand. You'll find those elsewhere. Here, you'll find quiet neighborhoods where the trees are taller than the homes. You'll also find neighborhood parks, large and small. Richfield also claims good public and private schools, an array of small businesses and national big box retailers, and is the corporate home of Best Buy. Richfield's biggest fan is probably Maria Regan Gonzalez. One of the legacies I know I will leave behind in six years of being in office is a strong foundation to support, protect, and improve the conditions of our affordable housing in our city. Gonzalez is the first Latina mayor in the Midwest. I'm a public health nerd. I love public health. It's my education. It's my background. Her day job? Well, Gonzalez is Systems Director of Equity Initiatives at M Health Fairview, Minnesota's largest health care group. Richfield's population numbers around 37,000. There's a lot being considered at City Hall and its accomplished mayor. And if you have any questions, please call myself Call your council members or call the city of Nearly 8% of Richfield's residents live on or below the poverty line. The Richfield residential vacancy rate hovers around 3%. But this town can tap into a diverse population. The city council, staff, public safety officers, and mayor are moving forward with them. Maria Reagan Gonzalez, mayor Thank of Richfield. You. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for inviting me. Now, you're not going to run again. No. I announced uh, maybe a month ago or close to a month ago that I'm not going to run for re-election. And why? Well, to be honest, I had never thought about staying in office for very long. Um, a career in politics was never necessarily an interest or a goal of mine, but it was a vehicle to make change in my community. and. Uh, I've always thought about maybe being in office a few terms and then hopefully building leadership of other people that could then run for office behind me. Um, but I'm also going to get married soon and we want to have a family and we're ready to have kids. And this job as mayor is really, it's a 24-7 job, but it's stipend. And so it's I only, have to have a full-time job. $20,000 a year, right? Is it, I, it might even be less than that. You ran for, for city council. Yep. You won that, served two years, yeah. ran for mayor. No one ran against you in yeah. the mayoral race. Yeah. Why? There's probably a couple reasons. When you think about local government, sometimes a lot of people end up running because they're angry about something, maybe organized trash hauling or yeah. something like that. But community members are very generally happy with the leadership, with what's happening. Um, but there was no angry folks running for office for mayor to change okay. things. But also, um, two years before, we had a very, very strong campaign and actually when I ran in 2016 and was elected, um, previous to that, people said, 
we don't think you're going to win. There's a pretty strong contender. Um, and they saw the people power that our campaign was able to build. So your term as mayor mm -hmm. has uh, worked on that. You, yeah. Have you gotten more people involved? And Yes, we have gotten many more people involved. I would say in terms of building the civic leadership of folks, I've been able to support a lot of new candidates in other cities to run for office, but then also in our own community, we've really had a push to get uh, more multilingual communications. Uh, we are doing more things for our community bilingually, um, looking at different ways to get community members involved through community, community engagement, but also our communication. Affordable housing has mm -hmm. always been an issue. Yeah. And especially in a community like Richfield, which has older homes, mm -hmm. uh, people living in homes mm -hmm. that were built after World War yep. II. Housing is very expensive Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. Tell me what, uh, what's been accomplished in Richfield over during your term. We've been able to do so much. I would say one of the legacies I know I will leave behind in six years of being in office is a strong foundation to support, protect, and improve the conditions of our affordable housing in our city. And it's been paired with just diversifying our housing overall. We have, I don't know, over by Target in East Richfield, we have over 70 new townhomes um, that weren't there as an option. So we've diversified our housing options in many different ways. We have close to $1 million condos behind um, Lake Winds Co-op, but we also have so many more uh, affordable housing options. So the areas that we've tried to focus on for renters are um, tenant protections, uh, preserving and improving existing affordable housing and creating new affordable housing. As it relates to affordable housing for homeowners, we have um, created a down payment assistance program for tw of $20,000 if you qualify to purchase your, fir your first home in Richfield, 0% interest and 100% forgivable to help diversify who is a homeowner in our city. And we have almost 100% of the folks that have applied and received those um, down payment assistance grants are within the target that we're looking for of people who are traditionally left out of home ownership. Mm -hmm. So we've done things to diversify affordable housing, not just for renters, but for homeowners as well. I asked Mayor Gonzalez about Woodlawn Terrace, which yeah. in December became Minnesota's 10th resident-owned manufactured home community. 53 homes are nested on 4.9 acres. They used to be called mobile home parks. Woodlawn Terrace is hidden off Lindell Avenue near 74th Street. Park that I would say the majority of our residents or people in general don't even know that it exists. It has this beautiful urban canopy of oaks and trees um, and it's been there for many years and just like so many other things in Richfield that they were built in the 50s. A lot of the homes were built in the 50s and 60s. Um, the infrastructure and the homes, you know, the quality was just going down. And the owner of the manufactured home park property is retiring and he was going to sell. He's, he sold his property and most people would sell it to a developer, displace all these families in this home, uh, in this park. And what happened is he sold it to the residents. So it became a cooperative owned uh, manufactured home park and then they paired and worked with the city to um, redo many of the homes there and bring new homes into the home park, add to it, but also use that down payment assistance program for more people to have homes that are affordable. Was that difficult? It was difficult for many reasons, just because there's so many steps, um, legalities, it can be a confusing process, especially for a person, you know, for any average person, you don't know what it means to be, to create a co-op. I wouldn't know how to start a co-op. And so luckily there's organizations out there that help with all of this. The second snag that we had was because the families don't own the land, but they only own the homes, they did not qualify for a lot of financial assistance programs. Um, through the state or through other vehicles. So we ended up changing our rules and policies for our city programs to then be able to apply to creation of affordable housing um, in the manufactured home. So there's this little, there's these little loopholes where technically, because you don't live um, on the land, they, do, they don't qualify. So we changed a lot of that. Um, and so we set a precedent for many other communities to say, 
you know, here we welcome manufactured homes in our community. Unfortunately, many other communities don't, and it's a great viable option for affordable housing. Mm -hmm. and, and show an example of how to partner with our residents to keep people in their homes and improve the conditions of their homes as well. One of my favorite parts of Birchfield is Woodlake Nature Center. Yes. It's boardwalks. Mine too. It's tall trees and all that. Mm -hmm. um, do you go there? I go there all the time. Yeah. I'm there on a weekly basis. It's actually my community office. If people want to have a meeting, they want to get together and talk, I say, let's go take a couple loops at Woodlake Nature Center and let's have a meeting there. I do appreciate the sound barrier next yes. to 35W yes. as well, yeah, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Where's your favorite place in Richfield to go out for a, a snack or a hmm. dinner or something like that? There's so many places. So Richfield has a lot of local restaurants um, that I love, and there's a lot of family-owned restaurants. There's El Tejaban, which is excellent Mexican food that most places don't have a little bit more traditional Mexican foods. That's a family-owned business. Um, there's Patrick's Cafe as well um, in West Richfield where you can get some great food, baked goods and coffee. There's so many places, but there's a lot of little great places um, in Richfield. Yeah, I, I go to Sandy's. Oh yes, on Sandy's Penn is Avenue, great. It's yep. south of 66th Street. I like a place that doesn't give you spoons or forks. Yeah. It just gives you the burger <laughs> and a real neighborhood feel. Yeah, and that's Sandy's. During COVID, they built a port so we yeah. can dine outside. That's great. Underneath an umbrella. Yeah, very in, nice. In the summertime. So. They actually opened, the owners of Sandy's opened a second restaurant in Richfield. It's called The Protagonist, and it's where the old Houlihan's used to be in Richfield off of um, Lindell's. It's the same owners, but it's a little more upscale. They have cocktails and really great appetizers and good food. Now, a, a lot of your, your personal mm -hmm. ethic, your view towards mm -hmm. humans and yeah. people of difference started when you were a kid yes. in Janesville, Wisconsin, yes. down near the Illinois border. I we believe. were the only Hispanic family in our Catholic school. In your so Catholic there was school. other Latino oh, okay. families in the city, okay. um, and we were friends with a lot of Latino families in Janesville. It was pretty segregated, though, and there was very few Latino families mm -hmm. at that time. But my brother and I went to a Catholic school, and we were the only multicultural family, um, just my brother and I. And you brought what you learned there as a kid yep. throughout yep. your entire life. Yep. And that's kind of been a, maybe a mission, of mm -hmm. getting along with people. Yep. After your term as mayor, is that how mm -hmm. you're going to raise kids, you're yeah. going to have a husband, that's, yeah. that's cool. But you're still going to be busy yes. at this stuff. Tell yep. me what you're going to focus on. Well, my working community will never end. Even since I was a kid, all I've been doing is working in service to community. I love to work with others in my community to make the conditions for other families and for for my neighbors a better place. Mm -hmm. I, I think the way my brother and I were raised by our parents, they told us that because we were privileged, because we were born in this country, we had a middle class education and upbringing, that that was a privilege and that we needed to use that privilege to improve the conditions of our community because not everybody had that privilege and so that is deeply ingrained in me um, and actually the reason I ran for office is I'm, I'm a public health nerd I love public health it's my education it's my background and the majority of what actually creates health for an individual or for a community is the conditions of their community in which they live and so that's actually why I ran for office from a public health perspective. So um, that's why we focus on affordable housing, walkability, bikeability, inclusion, because those are the things that at the end of the day are going to make you sick or healthy. And so um, I have a job today, a full-time job, in improving the conditions that um, make people healthy or sick at M Health Fairview. It's the mm -hmm. largest health system in Minnesota. It's the fourth largest employer in the state of Minnesota. And my job is to embed equity across every single thing we do as a business in our delivery of care, in our, deli in our care of patients, in our um, communications and relationships with the communities where we're located. Um, and my job is to make sure that everything we do is giving a fair, equitable, inclusive chance for everyone to be healthy. And so I will continue to do the same work. I will just have one full-time job, not two, doing okay. it. Um, and I'm still gonna do what I love. 
you've also been involved in uh, child care. Describe your work there, please. Yeah, so maybe eight or nine years ago, I was a co-founder of a child care provider network and mostly made up of Latina moms. We started with 13 women from Richfield um, because we were noticing, I'm not a mother, but I am a child care provider of my nieces, and we were noticing that there wasn't any support or education or training for people taking care of kids that were not licensed child care providers. Most of the programs through the state are for licensed providers. But if we think about who takes care of our kids, all of our kids are taken care of by aunties, grandmas, parents, siblings, and these are informal child care providers taking care of the majority of our kids, but there's no support for them. And then you look at non-English speaking families, it's even worse, there's nothing out there. And so you look at a, a school district like Richfield, that's 72% students of color, many of them immigrant and refugee families, and you start to see how we can get to a place where we have the worst racial inequities. It starts so young. So we said, we're not gonna let this be our future. We're going to create a network where we can educate and train ourselves to provide quality, culturally appropriate care so that our kids have a fighting chance and a great successful future as students and as adults. Um, and that group of 13 women grew to, we've trained over 350 women, and there's no other organization nationally like this child care provider network. And the women not only have been um, providing free monthly trainings to community members, they have passed affordable housing policies, they've worked on police reform, they passed Tobacco 21 ordinances in Bloomington and in Richfield. So they've really grown their civic leadership, they've gotten involved in many other ways, and they've really taken large steps to, um, to improve Richfield. And it's paid off, too, yeah. I mean, you know, for other cities, yep. too. Yeah, for the whole region. Now, I want to get beyond just talking about institutional equity. Yeah. About person to person equity. Mm -hmm. You've learned a lot. Absolutely. Uh, I feel like I got a PhD in human relationships okay. with okay. this job. <laughs> Good. What do you say to individuals if they're frightened to, say, work at a company that's largely white? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, not all of us white people are the same mm -hmm. by any means. Mm -hmm. We haven't quite figured out how yeah. to get along amongst ourselves, yeah. that's for sure. But what's your personal counsel to someone who's thoughtful, a little bit shy, and wary of applying for a job, or is not getting along in a mm -hmm. company very mm -hmm. well for reasons uh, having to do with their ethnic background mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. minority status? Actually, there's articles that have been written on the Twin Cities, and even though Minnesota has so many Fortune 500 companies and there's so many great employment opportunities for people of color and professionals of color, it's a very hard place to be for those very same reasons where you might be the only person, you might go into a work environment and culture that doesn't feel welcoming to you and who you are. Um, and so you see people of color being hired, and then you see people of color leaving, and you see them moving to Minnesota to come to these great opportunities in Fortune 500 companies, and then you see them leaving the state of Minnesota because they don't feel welcomed or included. And so it is incumbent upon all of us, whether we're leaders in a business, in a company, in a school, we need to figure out how to make our environments more welcoming and inclusive. Um, because if we want to continue to exist and we want to stay competitive as a region, if we want to provide conditions for everyone to, to thrive, we have to change the way we do things and we have to be more inclusive. And I would say people are so afraid um, because they're afraid that they're gonna say the wrong thing and they're gonna mess it up and they're gonna offend somebody. Mm -hmm. But I think if you can be self-aware and vulnerable enough to know that you're going to learn and grow and to try to be humble and put it out there, I'm learning, this is new for me, I wanna learn, I wanna grow, please give me feedback and just not be afraid, you, you're gonna mess up and you're going to learn a lot um, and, and just trying to learn um, because you're never gonna learn and we won't build an inclusive community if people don't stop being so afraid of offending everybody. And, and I'm not talking about let's all be rude to each other. I'm just saying be open, be vulnerable to learn something new, something that you don't know. Which doesn't mean you're going to give up on who you actually are. Exactly. Absolutely yeah. not. You need to own who you are. And part of building a community that's more equitable and inclusive also has to start with owning and understanding who you are and 
knowing how you show up in the world. And for example, that's part of white privilege or the privilege of anybody that um, anybody, we have different identities and they, you show up differently and being conscious of that is very important. Maria, thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there's something neat coming out in October called a WOW Cube. And it was invented by a 12-year-old kid who said to his father... Millions of us know Dick D. Bartolo as the Gizwiz. Dick reviews new gadgets on network and cable TV and social media. And uh, he's a big-time podcaster. With a phone, Dick was also a Mad Magazine's maddest writer. Tell me about it. This is a writer-oriented magazine. We don't, uh, we never assign topics. I just have to pick up my paycheck. In case you didn't know, we get paid scale. <laughs> <laughs> he became close friends with Mad Magazine's legendary publisher, Bill Gaines. Dick's memoir, Good Days at Mad, is out of print, but I have an autographed copy. Now, I'm not a drinking man and don't smoke weed, so when our sorry world wears heavy, I sometimes return to his book for the true stories, real accounts about the snarks at MAD who, with cartoon caption and parody, made fun of what America and the big shots pretended to be. In April, I visited Dick D. Bartolo in New York. Dick is a lifelong train fan has a scale model in what he claims and is a backyard. If we forget to bring it in, it gets frozen in a block of ice in the winter. Mm -hmm. And when it defrosts, it just keeps running. It's the same ones they use like at the botanical gardens. Well, Bill Gaines also loved trains big time. When MAD was in its prime, Bill ordered the staff to show up at Grand Central Station at a specific time and a specific platform. But he did not reveal why. Dick uh, now tells the rest of the story. One day he said, set aside this Saturday, plan to be gone all day, that's all I'm telling you. Uh, and I this said, is well, good. is this something I can invite Dennis to? And he said, well, I'd rather Dennis came than you, but since you like trains, you'll have to come. So that was one hint. Oh, he didn't say you like trains. He said, you have to come because this is especially for you. So we meet Grand Central Station. Uh, yeah, Penn, yeah, Grand Central Station. And they announced the Metro Line to Boston. And Bill says, go down to the track. Do not get on the train. It's just 12 of us. And I said, Billy, what the f is going on? He goes, just be patient. And then we hear a, a train whistle. And out of the tunnel comes a tiny little switch engine pushing an 1890s observation car. <laughs> and on the back of the car, there were three chefs, all in their big hats and their white aprons. And Billy said, this is your surprise. They're hooking this up to the Amtrak. We're going to Boston. They're gonna put this on a siding. I'm gonna stay on the train, but you guys have six hours in Boston and then come back at seven o'clock. They'll hook it up to the 7.30 uh, Metro line it back to, I think it went back to Penn. Didn't we have lunch first? Yeah. yeah, we had a gourmet, they had a champagne breakfast. Champagne breakfast, right. And then they had a sit down dinner with paired wine. I'm not a big wine kind of, so with Gaines is. And I mean, it was amazing. And the other, it was one of those old cars with the open platform observation and it started snowing <laughs> and we were sitting, uh, it was, it was a dream, a dream. Oh yeah. So on Monday I was so astounded by this train ride. I said, how do you rent a train? And he said, well, I, I found an ad for rent, rent a car, rent an observation car. And I said, can I ask what it costs? And he said, uh, okay. He said, the car is $5,000. Then it's about $1,000 uh, transportation because the car has to be shuttled. The car, I think, uh, homes in Virginia. He said, then Amtrak charges uh, a full fare coach, a full fare 
first class ticket fare for everybody on the train. And he said, so we had like two workmen and three chefs and then maybe 15 madmen. Uh, he said, anyway, he said it, it was 10 grand. I said, well, Billy, uh, that was one of the most amazing days of my life. <laughs> Jerry right. has a fan club. Boy, he's great. He's a doctor. That is the 340. I'm a big train fan. That is to let me know the Amtrak 340 Chicago Limited is leaving Penn Station and will pass two blocks from here in eight minutes. Is that on the screen? <laughs> no, there's other trains on the screen. Bill Gaines really loved the Statue of Liberty. Not only the one in New York Harbor, but wherever he could find a, a statuette or a, a curio that had the Statue of Liberty on it, he would collect it. Among Bill's bucket list of wishes was one that involved the help of his wife, Annie Gaines, and of course, Dick. Back in 1977, Bill wanted to climb to the torch held high by Lady Liberty. Uh, Dick knows a thing or two about navigating New York Harbor. He's captained an assortment of boats. So naturally, he calls up the National Park Office on Liberty Island. He asked for permission for Bill to climb up to the torch. Well, he got nowhere. Dick takes it from here. An incredible fan of the statue and a lifelong... Well, we had a whole collection of statues. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, his lifelong dream is to get up on the torch. And the guy said, no, he said it's impossible. He said, first of all, people think that they used to be able to walk up to the torch. You can't because it's a ladder. It's a hand over hand ladder. And up the arm, it's very narrow. And so it can't be done. So I, I was back at me and I said, Billy, I almost got you the Statue of Liberty. And I told him the story. And he said, call the guy up. Ask him if he has any kids, and if he has kids, tell him that if you can get me up to the statue, I will send him one of every issue of Mad ever printed. So I call the guy up, and I say Bill's offer. I said, do you have any kids? And he said, boy, I have two boys, one 12 and one 14. I said, oh, how would you like to have one of every issue of Mad. And he said, all right, we'll sure. do this. And then he mailed me a diagram. I, we were to take the last sightseeing ferry across. On the diagram was where to hide when the last ferry left. And then he came out after dark and he had this set of keys. <laughs> and I said, before we get up there, how are we going to get off this island? <laughs> and he said, at 11 o'clock, a ferry comes across to do a shift. That there are We have night workers here. And he said, there's a, a, a shift change. And he said, You'll, they'll, it's an outside service. They won't matter. We just tell them, take these two people back to Manhattan. Um, so we started up to the torch. You climb up the regular stairs, and then there's a chain over there, and you go up like three steps, and then you start a ladder, and then the ladder goes kind of backwards where the arm bends, and Bill was, Bill, Bill was overweight, and and Bill said, "Look, at you and Annie go to the torch, because if I get stuck here, <laughs> and we have to call for help, we're all going to be arrested." And this poor guy will lose his jaw anyway. So Annie and I went up to the torch and we took some pictures. Very windy, very scary because the torch moves a lot. Um, and we came down and, and that was it. So at least I gave Bill, at least I gave Bill into the torch, uh, <laughs> not all the way to the torch. That's a great story. Say, thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. 
This is Carol Sundstrom. 